The Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, thought he had it all figured out. He was killing Christians. He was doing what he thought was right. We talked about this yesterday. But he came to the conclusion that he had it all wrong. What if you're good? Is it good enough? Because that's what Paul finally came to the conclusion of. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, the Apostle Paul said he was the least of all the apostles. In Ephesians 3, 8, he said he was the less of the least of all the people of God. And in 1 Timothy 1, 16, the Apostle Paul said he was the chief of all sinners. What dramatic thing happened to Saul of Tarsus to bring him to Paul, to bring him about that he doesn't have it figured out? I got my coffee and I am drinking it. Let me give a shout out to all my people drinking coffee. Let me ask you this about Paul. Is he backsliding? Is there something going on in Paul's heart that we don't know about? Why is he making these definitive statements that he's nothing? He's the least of nothing. He's the chief of sinners. I mean, has he engaged in some secret sins that we don't know about? We know the word of God tells us that there's a war going on in the inside of Paul. And he says this, the good that I want to do, I don't end up doing the good. I end up doing what I know is wrong. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? He asks a question. And the answer we're going to find in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12. And again, what's the question? Who can save me from myself? Listen to this. There is no salvation in any other... For there is no other name under heaven given among men where I can be saved. What's that name? Jesus. See, Paul got to the place where he's not looking at himself prior when he was Saul of Tarsus. He's looking at his credentials. Hey, I'm a Pharisee. I, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of this tribe. I have this much education. I'm a part of this. I know these people over there. I'm highly honored, respected. I have money. I got everything that I want. I can basically write my own ticket. And he was living like that for a while. And then one day, unbeknownst to him, he's on a road with people, with papers that say, I have a license to kill. You know, he was like James Bond. That's what he had from the government, from those people. I can kill whoever I want if they're in the way, meaning if they're of Christ. And God strikes them down with light. And it's like thunder. And none of his servants really understood what was going on. But God was speaking to him clearly, plainly, in a manner, in a way, that there's not just thinking, well, was that me? Was that the Lord? Or was that Satan? Have you ever got a word and that's what you thought? Was that me? Was that the Lord? Was that Satan? No, no, no. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goads? Your translation may say it this way. Why are you kicking against the pricks? Basically, it means this. Why, Saul, are you fighting me? And many argue that that was the moment that Saul of Tarsus, his name changed and he got saved. He was blinded. Some believe it was when Ananias anointed him, laid hands on him, and prayed for him, and he received his sight. Last night, what were we talking about? My glasses. I lost them. People that believe they can see and people who are just downright blinded. What do they need? They needed the same thing Paul needs. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this. Are you kicking against the pricks? Are you kicking against the goads? Are, are you thinking that you have it all figured out? Friends, look at, look at two thirds of the Bible. Look at that much, that much, okay, was written by the Apostle Paul. And he's telling me, I don't have it figured out. But I know this, he has it figured out. Paul was a vessel of honor now that God could use. So what does God do with his new tool? 
his new disciple, his new weapon. What does he do? He takes him and he separates him from everyone for three and a half years. Just the Holy Spirit and Paul. And he teaches him correctly. Matt, I, th I thought Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That he was highly educated. He was this, he was that, he was all those things. But friends, all those things aren't enough. People just don't understand this. What if your good enough isn't good enough? Would you like to borrow from me? I mean, let's say you're short when you're standing in front of God one day. Would you like to look over and say, hey, could I borrow some of Matt's righteousness? But what if I told you this? I don't have any righteousness. I'm depending on someone who is good enough. That's Jesus. See, Paul, as he's growing, as he's being discipled, see, Paul had always relied upon his abilities, his strengths, his people, his knowledge, what he knew, how to get things done. Saul of Tarsus is a lot like you and I. You can take that person right out of Egypt, but it's much harder for God to take Egypt out of you. Paul screamed out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? In the book of Acts, it says, No other name can a man be saved other than Jesus. And if it's only Jesus that can save me, it's only through Jesus that I have light and life, that I can manage this through the way of the Spirit by way of inspiration, by way of decree of Almighty God. God. See, God doesn't want to fix you up. God wants to make you into something brand spanking new. As he does that, you start seeing things differently. Because Paul's saying, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the least of all people of God. I'm on the bottom. And yet he wrote two-thirds of the Bible. And you know what he said? My good enough is not good enough. Friends, if Paul's good enough, is it good enough to get to heaven? Why do we think that our good enough, our good works, are good enough to get to heaven? And in reality, I've had people argue this point. You are to do good works, okay? But the source of your behavior, the source of your life, the source of the light that comes out of you is Christ being led by him, his spirit. There's nothing wrong with ministering to people and blessing people and helping people, okay? But in the back of your mind, it can't be ordered from a man or men and it can't just be you thinking this is good to present to God. And once I mention what I did, I'm going to get a that -a boy. Get a that -a boy from him. Listen to him. Be led by him. Be empowered by him. Be strengthened by him. Be fed by him. Be forgiven by him. Be resurrected by him. Spend your eternity with him. What if your good just isn't good enough? Then I find someone who's good is good enough. And when I look in this book, there's only one person that I can find that was good enough the entire time. His name was Jesus. He was a carpenter. He lived 33 and a half years and gave his life a ransom to God, the Father, for you. Because you're good enough and my good enough isn't good enough. But God's only begotten son is enough. I accept him on his terms, on his conditions, knowing that I, I really want to go to heaven. Uh, knowing I don't have it figured out. Uh, I don't feel like I'm the chief of sinners because I know some really rotten people out there. But as you get closer to God, what takes place is you realize you could argue with Paul in saying, I am the chief of sinners, I am the least of the apostles, I am the least of all men to walk upon the face of the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs 
is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit means I am bankrupt. I have no remedy. I have a sickness. And the only cure is Christ. The only cure is the blood that was shed on Calvary that is applied to my account. I don't want the wrath of God on me. See, that's what I'm saved from. Holy God's wrath. And now I'm thinking, man, I don't want that. Well, Jesus took the fifth cup, which was the cup of God's wrath. And so when you are applying his good enough to your account, now the Father sees you through the Son, which has always been acceptable in the beloved. It takes God to get to God. If a person will say, I am, I am nothing in and of myself, I want to throw myself into the arms of God to be changed, what does God offer? Forgiveness. Total forgiveness for all your sin forever, unconditionally, provided by Christ. The greatest gospel verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me unpack those 15 Greek words. He, God, made Jesus sin. What do you mean he made Jesus sin? Only in one sense. He treated him as if... He had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. Hanging on the cross, he was wholly harmless, undefiled. Hanging on the cross, he was a spotless lamb. He was never for a split second a sinner. He is holy God on the cross. But God is treating him, I'll put it more practically, as if he lived my life. God punished Jesus for my sin, turns right around and treats me as if I lived his life. That's the great doctrine of substitution. And on that doctrine turned the whole reformation of the church. That is the heart of the gospel. And what you get is complete forgiveness covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When he looks at the cross, he sees you. When he looks at you, he sees Christ. I can't tell you the scores of people who have based their life on what they think is good moral behavior. Friends, Paul did that up front. Good moral behavior. But he got to the place where he realized my good is not good enough. And I am rotten to the core. And the thoughts that go through my head any given day, they're not bringing glory to him. Oh Lord, I know you want me to do this and I know this is the right thing to do. But I feel there's this tug of war in me. What do I do? What do I do? I, I know you want me to do this, but this is what I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can save me? Christ alone. I talk about this all the time. This universal process that men think it works out for everyone in the end. Friends, do you want to present your good enough to holy God that's asking, asking you, demanding of you? You're to be perfect. Never had cussed. Never have looked at a woman with lust in your heart. Never have stole anything. Friends, I could go on and on and on and on. Never had an enemy. Never thought about this or that or did this or that or cheated or so. You have to be absolutely perfect. And then when you're standing before holy God, you're going to have to explain why you live in flesh which has a sin nature. Even if you could go through this entire life, you're still standing before deity, before holiness, majesty, and you're going to come up wanting. You've been weighed. You've been tried. I I'm not enough. I can't fix this up. I can't do enough good. It's him alone. But once you get to the place where Paul got to, what a glorious day that is. Because... You basically put up the white flag and you say, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? And the answer is Christ alone. By no other name can people be saved. Christ alone. What a glorious day that is where I don't stress anymore. I'm still the rotten sinner. See, in all of us, we have the seeds of all the sins that could be committed in this lifetime. When you watch the news, when you read your tablet, when someone tells you something at work, at the lunch table about some horrific thing that someone did in another nation or in this nation or in this country, and you're just shaking your head, how could any human being do that? Those seeds are within your heart because you live in flesh. 
All Satan has to do is water them. All God has to do is back up and leave the hedge unattained. And guess what? That thing that you despised is who you are. And so what do I need? I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. I need to rely on him because his good enough is good enough. But see, from the outside looking in, Paul was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. He's crying out to God, God, I got problems. I got lots of problems. Take this thorn, take this sickness, take this hindrance. If you could just heal me, Lord, Lord, if you would just heal me, I could do so much more for you. Lord, I pray in Jesus name, take this affliction from me oh what i could do if you would just heal me oh what i would do for you take it away take this thorn take this burden rebuke satan from buffeting me oh god help help god help lord god lord god almighty i pray i'm hurting Lord God, I'm hurting so bad. This affliction, this pain, this ongoing thing in my life, you know what it is. I dare not even need to speak it. Will you please? Please, Lord God. Please, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, I cry out to you. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Jireh. Will you, Lord God, please take it from me? Oh, please take it from me. Please, Lord God. My grace is sufficient. Lord, for you, Paul, are made strong in weakness. The weaker Paul got, the less Paul relied on Paul and other people, the greater Paul became. When am I weak? Then am I strong? Listen to this commentary on this. It's amazing. Paul inherited a strength, a streak of steel that ran through his veins. David also commented on many years before Paul, it is God who arms me with his strength. Psalm 118.32 the same God who empowered David and gave him hinds feet and hands for war has empowered the Apostle Paul through weakness and reliance upon Jesus. He's the same God who holds his arms out to you and held his arms out as he was nailed to the cross. The Father accepted the Son. When you line up with the Son, the Father accepts you. There is no other name. Acts tells us that men can be saved. It is the most powerful name because it is the name that God has chosen for his son, Yeshua. Friends, I say this. I say we learn from Paul who finally figured out that his good was not good enough. Not because Paul wasn't doing good things, but because the standard was God. And if you don't understand God, his holiness, how majestic he is, <laughs> you're just going to think that you're enough and that you meet the standard. God never came for you to improve yourself. God came and was resurrected so you could be born again. And then God could accept you in the beloved on his terms, his conditions. The blood of Christ washes over your sin debt. And now the good that I do it's led by the Spirit of God, so it's already accepted by God. It's a wonderful place to be. Charles Stanley called it 
brokenness. Getting to the place where Paul got to. A.W. Tozier called it the abiding life. Luther threw his hat in there. So did Calvin. So did Augustine. All the big hitters of the faith came to a place where they found out the secret. It was nothing in them. It was everything in God. There's a book I read many years ago and I was astounded. It wasn't this big. It was called They Found the Secret. And it was all these people, Moody, Hudson Taylor, I mean, all of the big hitters, the biggest hitters in the, in the game. It, w- it was all of them. And he was telling a story how they struggle bust and how they just didn't feel like they were enough and they had did everything they knew to do and it just was not good enough. There was no peace in their heart. There was no contentment. There was no rest. They were a train wreck. And each one of them tells the story about that wonderful day that God came upon them in a mighty manifestation of who he is by way of the Spirit, by means of the blood of Christ. And they finally got it. I'm not good enough. Wow, how liberating. And I can never be good enough. And I can never do enough good. But he did. And he has. And all I have to do is believe and allow the Lord to have his way in my heart. I hope all of you get to that place. No matter where you go to church, what you believe right now, Friends, the Apostle Paul is murdering people. I'm hoping none of you are doing that. We don't actually pull the knife down. We do it more mentally. There's a lot of things we do and we can justify the sin because we don't know the God who saved us from that sin. But once we start getting closer and closer and closer to him, it's evident that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father unless it is exclusively through Christ alone. This is the man cave. Friends, let me give you the greatest key that I learned early on. Don't compare your life to your neighbor, to your boss, to this guy down the road, to the guy on the better side of the train tracks. Don't do it. When we look at Ecclesiastes 3 and it talks about the different seasons, one of the things, again, that I've learned over time and from some great men of God is you don't compare seasons because every season that you're in is designed by God to teach you something, to mold you, to build you up. And friends, if you're comparing this season where God is really chiseling away at your life, Compared to the last season where it was ease, comfort, and pleasure, obviously you're going to want to quit this one and go to that one, but we can never go back to a season. We can only bring with us what we took out of it as far as knowledge and drawing nigh to God. The seasons in life get us closer to God or they push us away from God because we don't understand what's going on and I want what that guy has. Friends, I have everything. Everything in my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing better. There's nothing more. Look at this life, it's fleeting. Look at when I mow the grass, not even an hour later, grass is withered. The Bible tells us that we are just, that's it. What are we? Dust in the wind and yet God. And the psalmist says, Lord, why would you even consider me? because of his great love for you. He's told us what he accepts and what he does not. Line up with this book exclusively, God exclusively, a personal relationship with him exclusively. Forget Satan, forget the flesh, forget the world, forget the liars across the lunch table, okay? This is the standard.